Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm so sleepy. Uh, welcome to uh, our panel this morning that I don't know the title of, and uh, evidently the schedule has a, a very nice description of what we're going to be doing today. Um, let's just go ahead and introduce ourselves, starting with you, Ms. Jody. I'm I'm loud. Okay. <laughs> I'm Jody Underwood. Do you want to hear more about me or just my oh, name? Yeah, yeah. Let us know who you are. Uh, oh wow, who am I? I'm a dancer first. Um, I I live at Bardo Farm, um, and uh, I don't I don't know what else to say. All right, we'll let uh, other people talk about you. And oh, she's she's an early other. yeah. Oh, 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 uh, Jody and uh, her husband and another couple moved here from Pennsylvania, right? Okay. And about four years ago, and have started the and have started the Bardo Farm, and uh, trying to live the life of sustainability and living off the grid, and uh, helping people uh, learn about farming. So it's really great what you're doing, not only doing yourselves, but trying to uh, teach others. Should I introduce Carla? So she can't. I'll introduce Carla too. Carla Garrick is uh, currently the president of the Free State Project. She is an attorney. She has the most initials after her name of anybody in the book of speakers. MFA and MF and QQ and I don't know what, I don't know what all those are, but she's a recovering attorney and she works for a nonprofit writer's workshop in Manchester. And uh, she's pretty awesome. And she's, her voice is a little hoarse this morning, so she's gonna have to really speak in the mic. And I'm Mark Warden, Porcupine Real Estate. Thank you, yeah. And I want to do a shout out to Hannah, Hannah Hoffman, who did the jingle for Porcupine Real Estate. It gets in your head. Yes, yeah, so if you listen to the Free Talk Live uh, podcast, you'll hear it there. And I'm also a state rep, so I'm into politics. I've been elected to the state legislature here in New Hampshire twice. And on the local planning board, which is, uh, oh, that's one of the worst things ever. Oh, oh shoot, this is on tape. I, I hate planning board. It's tough for a... Uh, Speaking of non-aggression principle, the NAP, it's, it's tough for somebody who truly believes in property rights and individualism to be on a planning board where you tell people, no, you can't do that. So it's a bit of a disconnect, but uh, you, most of our votes are five to one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jason's going to be our moderator today, and we're going to talk about the non-aggression principle, etiquette, um, what else? Common sense, Common sense and group dynamics. And it's kind of a funny way to do it here in the morning where it's, everybody's so quiet. So uh, should we, I think we should um, study the group dynamics of the audience and pick on them, <laughs> read their body language and such. I'm glad we have this trash can here because I'll probably need to vomit at some point. <laughs> so anyway, if you don't know me, I'm Osborne. Um, you may know me from SACL CAI or School Sucks Podcast or... I'm making obscene gestures at your grandmother on the highway, but it probably doesn't really go very well with what we're talking about today. But Nor does vomiting in the trash can. Probably not. So anyway, um, I remember, uh, so we had a panel like this last year, and I, I called it together because at, at the time I was, I was interested in this notion of, um, you know, how, how do we act toward one another um, in addition to the strictly uh, non-aggression principle, right? Because um, yes, you don't uh, throw an ax at a baby, uh, congratulations, but th I think there's a little more to being a good neighbor than that. And I, I think we observe uh, some behavior among um, people in our community that maybe uh, doesn't, doesn't fall into the good neighborly category. And I, I'm just interested in thinking about maybe some principles that we can uh, put into place to uh, think about how we act. And it, would anyone like to just make a few comments to get started? Sure. Um, first, I want to talk about what, what we mean by etiquette. I was talking to somebody last night, and I said, I'm on this etiquette panel. And he's like, oh, I hate etiquette. That's just dumb. <laughs> Argue against it the whole way. <laughs> and I was like, well, how do you define etiquette? And let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. Um, so for me, it is this common sense thing, how to behave with other people, how to, you know, you know, the kindergarten rules, right? 
Um, and it's not, it's not silverware. Just don't even think about silverware. I shouldn't even have mentioned it, right? You did not hear about silverware. Um, but it is, it's how to act with people. And, and, and so the non-aggression principle is interesting because there have been some cases that we've heard about um, at Porkfest and wherever um, where people are just rude to each other. So there's an example. There are some, um, the RVs, they, they stay here for the summer. They're not part of Porkfest. And they, they, I don't know what they call them, like the permanent residents, I'm not sure. And they've had some weird interactions with some of our people. There was a dog barking, for example, incessantly for two and a half hours. This woman had come home from work. She wanted to relax on her porch, on her RV. And she asked them if they could keep the dog quiet. And they were like, I'll do what I can. And they were rude, you know? And they didn't. And the next day, it was the same thing. And she got really upset. And she's like, well, if you don't, us, one of, I mean, I say us, but it's not me. I'll tell you that. Um, she was like, if you, if, if you don't like it, you can leave. You shouldn't even be here anyway. You're not part of Porkfest. It's like, excuse me? Let's be good neighbors. These are the people that are letting us be here. If, if I mean, look, Rogers likes us. We give them a lot of money, right? But if we continue to piss off our neighbors, this isn't going to work. So, um, uh, well, I have more to say about this, but basically they're acting like assholes. And... Is that the non-aggression principle? Were they hurting one another? Are they, you know, invading their ear space, their relaxation space? Like, where, you know, where does that begin and end? Um, I think if people act like assholes, um, it's going to make other people want to set rules, which is going to piss off the anarchist crowd. And it's this, you know, well, then don't act like an asshole. Then we won't want to make rules. If you, you know, how does this go? If you, if you poke a lion, expect that you're going to get bit or attacked or whatever. If you think people aren't going to make rules, your expectations are in the wrong place. It's just what people do. They want to live comfortably themselves and not infringe on others. Um, well, no, they, want, they don't want other people to infringe on theirs, but they sometimes forget that they have the same thing against them from other people. Okay. <clears throat> My main thought on this has to do with how we talk about politics, because I think a lot about how we communicate as libertarians to uh, either normal people or the rest of the world, the unnormal people. And it's a little different here because you're surrounded by 1,500 other people that get it. They speak the same language. And so we're spending 90% uh, of our time talking about the 1% of things we disagree on with the person at the uh, campfire. But remember, after you leave here on Sunday or Monday, you're going back to the real world where people don't quite understand that. So I think Michael Cloud, who was a very, at one time famous libertarian uh, expert and activist and uh, campaign manager, he had a, a books on tape, a number of books about the art of libertarian persuasion. Uh, Mary Ruard has done some of this too, but remember, go softly. Uh, my only recommend, recommendation, if you want to uh, actually reach people and connect with them, is to first start by finding common ground. Right, you may be maybe a total leftist, and that person thinks that the government should do everything except for uh, what she can do with her body or what he or she can smoke. Right, so let's find common ground with uh, cannabis legalization, and then move slowly into the other steps and try to bring other people into libertarianism. But uh, oh yeah, Michael Cloud used to call it the libertarian macho flash, which you get right into somebody's face. Say, oh, we don't need the government to build the roads. We don't need the government, and people are just going to shut off. So. My advice uh, to be effective, again, is to ease into it and find common ground and, and be gentle and, and uh, friendly to these people. Um, uh, oh, wow. It's not that bad. Sorry, I'm going to be a little raspy. But um, the problem with this panel, we realized last year, was the people that we really actually should reach are not the people who are here. <laughs> it's like this is pretty much an asshole-free zone right now. <laughs> I'm willing to take a poll, and um, so there is that sort of challenge, right? It's it's the people who who don't really know they have a problem who have the problem. 
Um, for me personally, you know, I, I like to look at things from a voluntarist perspective, sort of, okay, if, if we magically had no government, you know, how would the world work? And I like to think it would kind of work like Downtown Abbey. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that show, but it's a, um, it's a British show and it's set um, between the two world wars. And it's sort of the life of upstairs and downstairs, right? Because people do have different economic abilities to, you know, people, there are different economic stratus and stuff. And sometimes questions of etiquette and stuff can come from there as well. And I'm not talking silverware either. I'm talking how do you make rules that sort of are common sense. And then you go back to things like um, chivalry from the past and, you know, duels at dawn. I mean, there are a reason these, these rules sort of evolved. I have jokingly suggested to the organizers we should give everyone a glove in their, in their bag <laughs> when you come in, you know, and, and just sort of as a reminder to that idea of, you know, be on good behavior and, and, you know, don't be an asshole. So I don't know that uh, any of us up here have any particular expertise in this area. So um, if anyone else in the audience would like to um, ha ask any questions of each other or um, us or anybody. OK, go ahead, Joseph. So I, I feel like I woke up at a fairly young age and I have been sort of an isolationist because of that. And uh, so sometimes I might come across as an asshole because I've just kind of had to be because I couldn't agree with anyone on so many different points that I, I just had to be like, okay, you guys are all screwed up and I'm the only one who gets it. it you know, in, in my family, in my community, it was just like, I, I live with a bunch of people who are like, you got to shop the gap and have all the greatest things or you're not a person, you know? And there was a point there and then I had to give background on myself. Uh, well, I was thinking that maybe next year to get more people here, you could name it something like farting in public and picking your nose on stage. <laughs> so I, I guess that's, that, that was my point. Yeah. Well, in response to your story about feeling like an outsider or isolated where you live, there is a, a pretty easy way to get over that. Yeah. Move to New Hampshire, be surrounded by another a bunch of nuts. Yeah, Tim almost doesn't need a microphone. His voice is, uh, it um, really resonates. Maybe you made the comment about more than likely the people that are attending the etiquette session aren't the people who need the lesson. So maybe there's an opportunity to turn the conversation briefly about, okay, what's the best way to approach somebody that you're observing with a problem? And because you know they're probably even going to be a bit, even though you are on their side, they're going to be a bit resistant and offended by your approach. So. How can you, you know, maybe a bit of a conversation on ideas and on how that could, you know, approaches to to the people who are not being at, who are being. You asked. slap them with a glove. <laughs> no, that, that's a great question. Um, Dula Dawn, that's right. <laughs> um, Jody mentioned something last year when we did this, and we were talking about it earlier in the week. Um, there are several things, right? So first of all, there's things like body language. Um, I find that some people here, you know, they have a pretty close talking range, you know, they like to be right up on you. So in a situation like that, there are ways to deal with it. You know, you can take a step back or you can be like, hey, you know, or spray yourself with bug spray. I find that works pretty well right there. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's the sort of body language part, and then there's just the bombastic or the, and in s different situations, it's different right here at Parkfest, you know, it's just enthusiasm and people are just passionate and they're just, they're, they're so happy that they found someone who understands them. So, you know, here it's, it's maybe a little different. Um, it boils down to respect. You know, we had an issue with the drumming circle. We always have an issue with, you know, something. And it's a question of, okay, how do they react when you, when you go and you talk to them? You know, we're not usually mean or rude or anything. We're like, hey, guys, you know, it's your first warning. Okay, it's your second warning. 
don't make me come back here. You know, so, um, so maybe, you know, trying to de-escalate in some situations. And then to that gentleman's point, Joseph, um, you said something telling where you said, you know, I'm right, and they're, you didn't say I'm, they're wrong, but, you know, that sort of idea. I mean, I think sometimes we suffer from, it's like a Spock complex, right? We're very logical and we're very rational, and it's frustrating when people, <laughs> well, you know, I'm the exception to the rule. <laughs> I'm an artist, I'm allowed. <laughs> um, but, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, Spock, yeah, sort of the Spock syndrome, right? So we're very logical, and some people that just doesn't resonate with them. So to Mark's point, you have to find that sort of in where instead of talking at someone, you're talking with someone. All right, so I apologize for, for Carla is very rational. She, she starts in, in maybe irrational spaces, but she's so open to the rational part. She really is. <laughs> um, but you, what you said was you wanted to impose rules on the, the drum circle instead of trying to say, hey, what's a good compromise here? Just as another way of going about it, right? Um, people don't like to have rules imposed on them. Now, if they f openly understood all right, I'm being shut off. Okay, and uh, maybe it's the microphone. If they understood what the, I don't know, the pork fest agreements are, you can, I don't know, it still feels like rules to me. Sorry? The social contract. The social, well, right, yes. And ha ha, but there, there is a contract, but, um, and so maybe, in some sense, it's not a good example. I, I might want to talk about the gullet, right? In that situation, that was an interesting one. Or, um, Right. Uh, what's the full name of what they were? The my, our food, your gullet. They they were vendors at Porkfest, um, for three years until last year. And um, and fill in if I don't know the whole story. But uh, and they were right in Agora Valley, and they were very loud. And they they used a chainsaw to like announce when food was ready, um, which is it's interesting. I don't think anybody got hurt, which is what one you know some people might be afraid of. They, oh. Okay, did you hear her? We asked them to take the chain off. That makes it a little safer and people can trust it more, right? But then they were loud like all night long. And some people actually liked this. They had their music blasting and, you know, um, but most of the vendors around them who are all pretty much partiers, they were not happy with it. But there were other people who wanted to party all night and they liked the vibe and like, what do you do there? And so actually, Carla, I want you to tell us what happened with that. Oh. Huh. So, so that night, you know, was loud and, and definitely um, um, I know Jason had gone over and talked to them and, you know, said, hey, don't, you know, let's the next night, let's not be so loud. Can you sh shut it down? You know, the, we did communicate with them. And there's this thing that happens where um, if someone's in trouble, it's, you know, the pass the buck. So it's like, it wasn't me, I, I don't know, it was him, oh, it wasn't him. You know, it was the same thing with the drumming circle. So one of the things I love about the gullet story is um, the next morning, someone was frustrated enough that they had made a flyer and they went to town and they uh, had a boycott flyer made up with, uh, you know, suggesting and going around the campground saying, you know, if you don't like music blaring at three o'clock in the morning because you have little kids or you're a vendor and you have to get up and make some money the next day or, you know, whatever the reason is, um, then boycott this place. What I love even more about this story is then the gullet went and they started telling everyone, if you bring the boycott um, paper in, the flyer in, you'll get a free meal. <laughs> Which I actually thought was pretty ingenious, right? Um, so, you know, that was sort of a playful way. Um, after they were here, we made a decision that they probably weren't a good fit for our festival. You know, it, it's a big tent, but it's sort of like, okay, like, we, you know, we're all trying to get along. So, you know, if you consistently are, maybe the first night they didn't know, you know, and so you're, okay, we'll give you a freebie. But by the third night, it's like, okay, you know, we're clearly not communicating here. We're not on the same page, right? So um, 
I don't even think we ever told them. I'm, I'm friends with some of these people, and I never directly told them, hey, you know, you guys aren't welcome here. I think they started to understand that from posts that were made on Facebook. And the day we came up, so I was up here on Sunday, and I really haven't been on my phone or on Facebook or anything, but I noticed there was like a 40 comment thing on a photo or something I'd posted. And I just briefly scanned through it, and it was sort of them being like, yeah, you know, Park Fest is lame because you guys don't really believe in freedom because if you believed in freedom, then we're allowed, you know, my freedom is I'm allowed to do this at three in the morning. And it's like, okay, no, it's not for several reasons. It's a campground. There are rules of the campground. There is also a private contract between us and the owners of the, the property, and we have to live by their rules. So this sort of idea of freedom means I'm free to do what I want, when I want, where I want, um, both hurts our message, I think, because, you know, that's something that scares people because, you know, it's, it's, it seems dangerous and weird and, you know, whatever. And also, that's not the society we're going to build or that's not the way the world works. You know, you don't just get to do what you want. And if you want to be that person, then you go buy your, you know, 200 acres somewhere and, you know, do your chainsaw juggling there on your own private property and, you know, do it that way. So that's what happened with the gullets. Uh-oh, here comes a tough one. Little old me? So on the social contract, the, the problem with that is, as we understand it when we hear it, it's not voluntary. You know, people are saying, well, you have to do this. But there is such a thing as a social contract that is voluntary. Nobody has to be here. The campground does have rules. We have rules, not rules, but the guidelines on the back of um, the program. and. I mean, the, the stated social contract for the libertarian movement is you can do anything you want as long as it doesn't hurt other people. That's our social contract. So then people just have to have a little bit of common sense. But what does it mean to hurt somebody? And that's where one of the lines are, right? Oh, I'm hurting your ears? That's not really hurting. I'm calling you names? That's just air. You don't have to listen to it. Yeah. More? You're probably too young to know who Phil Donahue is, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was on the Phil Donahue show. I was in the audience, but I was on camera all the time. I sat right next to him. I was, it, was, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, and he's pretty liberty-minded. He's pretty open about a lot of things. But uh, uh, you touched on something that I think is uh, kind of obvious, the fact that a lot of kids, a lot of Ron Paul, liberty-minded, uh, free thinkers, uh, do tend to be quite arrogant, obnoxious, and I think the word etiquette fits in rather well, that there's an enormous lack of etiquette, common sense, rationality, manners, um, maturity, in an enormous amount of Ron Paul supporters. Um, you know, I'm 43, came up the past two campaigns, came up to help New Hampshire because I live in Connecticut and I'm getting nowhere down there. Yeah. I mean, you talk about, you know, drowning in the, li the liberal mindset. It's just... So, uh, anyway, um, I have... I found that it's shocking. It's eye-opening. The, the, the arrogance, you know, almost to the point of, like, the, uh, the, uh, the Wall Street, um, Occupy Wall Street people, where they just feel that they're entitled to all these things. Um, that I have the right to, to do this. You know, I'm flexing my First Amendment rights and free speech. It's like, well, and, and I always find it very difficult how to approach it, you know, without looking like dad, you know, to so many of these kids. You know, I feel like it sometimes. You know, they're all, you know, covered with, you know, acne and everything. <laughs> but uh, but I've, so many times I'm like, no, asshole. It's, it's based on a, a basic rule of law. The, common, the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, basic rule of law, minimal government. But you still need a small amount of it to keep you people at bay, you know, to, 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 to stop treating other people like shit. And that's basically the... And I have a hard time dealing with the Ron Paul supporters. And, and I'm, you know, my, myself, you know. Uh, I, 
I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but I can't go to any of these Star Wars conventions because have you seen the Star Wars fans? You know, <laughs> but uh, it, it's 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 a very hard road, you know, to, to to deal with so many different mindsets: the liberal mindset, the um, the complacent mindset, who, who could care less about you know government or voting or anything other than themselves, their job, and and everything. So it's it, it's a difficult road. Well, the thing is. Um the way I look at life is I'm like, empathy goes a long way, right? <clears throat> so maybe a question you could ask yourself is, hey, what was I like when I was a, you know, pimply-faced kid, you know? Um, it's, it's easier, obviously, the older we get, we look back and we're like, oh, you know, I was never like that. But, you know, maybe you were. And, you know, with 20 years more wisdom than they have, it's, um, I, I think the empathy part goes a long way. As a writer, you know, I always talk... Um, I feel like I grew up, I mean, I did actually grow up all over the world, but I was a big, big reader, right? And I actually think that's why one of the things that makes me very empathetic is because I've met all these hundreds of characters and hundreds of books and hundreds of situations, you know? So whenever I meet someone, I'm just kind of like, oh, you're like a character in a book, so let me see what I can find to like about you, you know? Because we kind of are a fairly unique character-driven group of people. Um, so I would say, you know, maybe even wear the dad hat, but then be like, I want to be the good dad. I want to be the cool dad. I want to be the dad people like. So how can I find some common ground with them? Um, as to the arrogance, that's the folly of youth, right? We, we all outgrow it at some stage or some of us never do. Um, but it is a challenge. Um, and it's a challenge that we need to overcome. One of the, um, the heartening things is there were a lot of speakers here and at all the other conferences I go to. Everyone is really talking about how do we make this message more palatable? How do we sort of overcome this almost handicap that we have? You know, when you have all these smart, opinionated, you know, arrogant people and it's, it's, how do we massage the message? How do we really learn how to make it more palatable to people? And part of that is really self-policing yourself. And just to add on to that, nobody likes to be told they're wrong, right? So, oh no, you're an idiot, you're young, you don't know yet. But it just doesn't help, right? You gotta somehow find common ground and, yeah, I don't know. I mean, empathy is good, but how do you get there? I, I love that. Find something that you like about I have a really hard time with that. Um, yeah. It's not on. I think it, um, it might be helpful when you're, you know, encountering people who are being too assertive, maybe in a social sense, you know, to just grant them, yes, you're right. You do have the First Amendment rights. You know, you do have the ability to speak and, you know, you know, be assertive in your beliefs. But pragmatically speaking, you're hurting the cause because you're not winning people over. Okay, when, when people see you, they're saying, oh, that guy's a libertarian. What an asshole. You know, libertarianism is full of assholes. You know, I, I can't, you know, if it, it, people aren't going to relate to you if you're, if you're just pushing them away that way. You know, so maybe, maybe you can make the pragmatic argument and say, you're not helping the cause. If you really, you know, care about this, you'll put a better face on it and try to woo people over, you know, try to win people over, um, you know, but I don't know, maybe, that, maybe that's a helpful tactic in some way. Just right. You know, I mean, this is a, this is a huge question that, that you're putting out there and that has, has come up. You know, it's how do you talk to other people? But honestly, I think we need to learn to talk amongst ourselves. And if we can't do it here, I mean, there's this saying, eat your own dog food. Um, if you try this thing, you got to try it for yourself first. See how it works within you, the group. So you're already, you already have the common ground. You're already friendly. So, you know, what if you're in the quiet campground, right? And I'm, I'm going to come back to noise because I've heard so many issues about noise this pork fest. You're in, you're in the um, quiet camping area, meaning not down here where it's noisy. And, the, and I think these things were made clear that if you're in the, in the far reaches, it's meant to be quiet. And so you go there with your families, but then you find that you got these guys next door that are blasting their music at 2 in the morning. This is, you know, it's a quiet area, and you ask them nicely to, to shut it, and then they um, turn around and, and call you an asshole or an idiot or whatever. It's like, then what do you do? Right? I, I don't necessarily have an answer. I mean, anybody else want to say how they would address this? 
Uh, you know, that doesn't always work. Uh, it, okay, it's on. Uh, but it's a good I, I, I don't have an answer. I actually have another question <laughs> about, uh, I'm, I'm all for people selling weed, selling cigarettes, selling whatever. Now, this is the thing. If people are selling alcohol and uh, Crosby, Crosby gets, is it Crosby? Isn't that right? He, I believe he got a, a liquor license or something, I, was my understanding. So if, you know, if this guy wants to sell me a beer because he brought a truckload of beer in, how do I address that with him? Like, the guy who is letting this happen is going to get busted. You know, I'm, I'm... Call the cops, clearly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you gently approach that? Wait, microphone. Well... <laughs> Great. Start by being a good neighbor, right? Hey, you know what? Keep that under wraps because we don't want to get caught doing that because we like Rogers. We want to stay here. And I think it's wrong. It's up to you. But you're, you're making it bad for everybody else, right? I mean, you don't want to point the finger. You're wrong, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, be a, be a neighbor. That, that's a place to start. Can we get back to the noisy campers and what we do about uh, them? Yeah, no, that's where I was going to go. You know, I think that, that kind of what you said, you know, you make an understanding like, hey, listen, I'm really cool that you're jamming out at 2 o'clock. I get it because I'm drinking and I'm having fun too. But I know there's a family next door to me. And it's, I don't think it's just me that, you know, or I, I, you know, I guess if I was the family, I don't happen to have one, you know, but I'd approach my other campers. Hey. You are your family. I am my family. Uh, you know, I'd get that backing. I mean, we do have support. We're, I mean, we're supporting each other, politi our political beliefs and our political activism and our, like, let's get support in social. Hey, listen. I understand that you're you're rocking out and having a great time, but can you take it down a few notches? You know, it's not just me, you know, and it's, it's the family next door, they're having some issues, and I know that the people next to me feel the same way. And I, I know that's kind of like, like group thinking them, and that might be the argument you get from an asshole, but I'm sorry, you're the douchebag. You know, if you're in Manchester, there's the, the morning thing, like who's the douchebag in the situation, and that's you. So. So how do you help them realize they're a douchebag? Telling them they're a douchebag is not going to convince them, oh, and, right? How yeah. do you help them see that? Because they're not. They're already stoned, right? Something. They're, they're drunk. Whatever it is. Or just an they're asshole. Altered. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so you could move your whole campsite somewhere else, right? Or I mean, that, that's part of the thing here. Or maybe make some kind of agreement. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do have security. And... Um, well, it's not, though, because this is a private event, and it's not using the state, so it's not calling the cops. And, you know, maybe there are systems that, you know, we have a, a you know, daily douche list, and it's like, you know, if you, <laughs> if you, if you, you know, you don't want to make the list. People Public will self-police themselves. Away. Yeah, yeah, because, um, yeah, we... <laughs> I mean, another challenge, of course, is, you know, a lot of times these situations, you're not dealing with people at their finest moment. You know, they're probably a little uh, drunk and, you know, maybe not their most rational self. So that can be a challenge as well. But, I, I, you know, I'm all for, for, for the shaming. Um, people do it once, they won't do it again, you know. So... Okay, I was thinking about that whole noise thing. Um, so, I was thinking about universality. So obviously they're okay with playing music at two in the morning. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but when I'm up till two in the morning, I usually don't get up very early in the morning. So, I think, I think my, 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 a, my attitude would be with, if they're kind of not cool or shutting things down, I think maybe at six in the morning, you know? Well, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd turn stuff up, you know? Stuff that I, you know, Maybe they might not like, but I really like. Because obviously it's okay, right? Because, you know, I mean, right? I you mean, know, it's universality, okay? Yeah. Right, and, and I get that, and that, that makes sense from one perspective, but that's like, uh, there's a term for it, but w what it's not is, well, it's kind of, well, it's, it's just, 
It's fighting back. It's actually adding aggression and it could escalate. They could get it, they could learn it. But I like the be the change you seek approach. Act like the person you want the world to look like. Is it the one that's blasting their music at six in the morning? Right? I, I agree, I agree. I mean, my initial approach would be to say, hey, you know, can we work something out here? Right. Day you know, three you know, is yeah, six you know, a.m. But, but, right. but the thing is, you know, I mean, after a while, that's not working. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, I've dealt with people like that, that play their music loud and, my, you know, and I've gone to them and said, hey, you know, can you turn it down? I mean, throughout my life, you know, and I've always got, you know, the big, you know, and that, that's, that's pretty much my, my the response I've got. So anyway, but I'm just saying, you know, that's always an option. Okay. All right. That's good. But how about, how about you talk to the person and you realize, oh, hey, we both like shooting. Hey, let's go shooting sometime. Or they, or they like sweets and you bring them something and suddenly there's a softer thing going on and maybe they will turn down their music when you ask because now you're friends. And so you have to get past that first thing. I mean, it's hard, right? But it's another way to do it. I ask them to move down here because here people stay up all night or whatever and they say up there people come because they know it's going to be quiet and they can camp peacefully but down here they're, it's supposed to be noisy and it's worked for me so far. They've actually moved for you? Or quieted down at least. Nice. This is my first pork fest so I'm the newbie I guess. Um, Welcome. Um, thank you. I mean, all these issues seem to boil down to respect and, and uh, space, I guess. And uh, I didn't handle signing up, but I'm the one that's followed the, what you guys have been doing for the last near decade and have been trying to get us here, although my wife made the reservations. But it sounds like most of this could be handled up front with better communication and segregation of... Um, I didn't get any indication even until really now about there's supposed to be designated areas for certain sorts of activities and so maybe if that were better communicated as part of the advertising package from the very beginning that if you've got a family and you need to be quiet at certain hours whether it be 6 a.m. or 2 a.m. whatever it happens to be for you this is the area that you might want to look at even the goal at issue sounds like it might have been handled with some sort of here's a space that you could do that and not interfere with anybody and yet do the thing you want to do, but we need to have different zones for different people that are dancing to different vibes. I think that's a point well made and well taken. It's in the brochure that we got in a bag, but who has read every page, right? Very few of us. And um, that's... Well, I'd say, yeah, when you register, maybe we could tell every person, hey, make sure you look at page three. Here's how it works with the, uh, the quiet zones. But the fact is, there are a lot of people that are just coming in very fast, and we're trying to get them going so they can have fun. But I think that's a, that's a good point, and we can communicate that better in the future. And there's just not enough land here to make that level of noise in the middle of the night while people are sleeping. So. Yeah, and, and I mean, it certainly is something we've improved upon over the years. It seems like the problems um, get less and less. And, you know, people are people. They're, they're, they're sometimes, you know, Someone did play their music loud, someone complained, they quieted down, then maybe they got loud again because they forgot, because they were drunk face. Um, and then that, the person who made the original complaint sort of sees that as like a, 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 an actual affront to them. And it's like, no, you, you probably don't even factor into this. So it's always good to look at it from sort of both sides. Um, I do think going forward, I mean, we do have the zones on the map that was on the website and all of that, but I do think there are better ways, and maybe we do it even with coloring, so it's like, you know, this is the red zone, and out there is like the ice blue zone, and I know that's quiet. My name is Keith. You recording? All right. I'm sorry. I don't know how to use this. Just uh, talk. If I could offer a little perspective um, and maybe um, a suggestion to the gentleman's uh, question before about how to approach people. Um, I work in an industry with very aggressive types of people. It's commercial construction, and I'm in management. And so we've done a lot of training on how to get people into the compliance mode. You know, we have a lot of uh, you know, safety and industrial process that we need them to comply with, with certain procedures. So the training that we receive is to always keep three things in mind, which is to at first, respect their perspective and their individual humanity, their people with a life that you don't understand. 
to explain the context of your approach to them, and then finally to request that they comply. So always remember that you are not responsible for their reaction or their actions. You're only responsible for your actions. And all that you can do is ask them to change their actions. You can't force them. You can't put your will on top of theirs. You can't you know, enforce your, your edict. So just a, a general scenario would be, if someone is doing something that you want them to change, you would say to yourself, OK, I'm not that person. I don't know why they're doing it. I can't understand their life. Re approach them with that respect. Explain what's going on. They probably don't realize what they're doing. And most of the time, you'll find that people want to help you. So if you ask them for help, and you say to them, look, there's a problem I have in my life. This music is hurting you know, my ears, or my kids can't sleep, or something. They're going to want to naturally help you. But you have to explain that to them. So just respect their, their humanity. Do not come up to them with anger or aggression, because it will only beget more anger. Ask them for help. And most of the time, 90% of the time, they are going to do it. And the worst thing in the world that they do is curse you out. And you're not responsible for that. You can't be responsible for their actions. All you could say is, look, OK, he's not going to answer you know, what I have to say to him. I'll move on. And at that point, you know, in the 3% of the time that they don't actually comply with you, well, then you go seek remedies from another source, either through a disciplinary action or you find some negotiated settlement. But all you generally have to do is ask someone to help you, and you know, people want to help you. Oh, that, that, that's a really nice way of, of putting that. And I'd like to use that to, to take a little aside. So the thing with the microphone just now, um, I, it really bugs me when, um, when we have a microphone, and not just here, this is like anywhere, um, and people are like, oh no, I can speak loudly enough and everybody can hear me, right? Guess what? I'm hard of hearing. And it really helps me when people use the microphone and use it well. I have to focus on what you're saying so hard that I can't even hear what you're saying. So thank you for using it when you are asked, and thank you for helping me hear you. <laughs> uh, well, um, just in, in terms of, uh, I think the comment came up before when we were talking about kind of how you handle it as the aggrieved party and some of the tactics you can use. I think maybe there's an opportunity, and, and it was touched on slightly before, for those of us here who are hearing about this to play a role of intermediary. In other words, when we're not the aggrieved party, but if we're observant enough that we can see someone else in trouble, you know darn well that they're going to be at a distinct disadvantage in terms of controlling their own anger and, and dealing with the, uh, the, the person who's causing the problem. So if we can see, if we can see it happening, kind of step in on behalf as the, the, you know, you can play buddy much more easily when you walk up to somebody and say, by the way, I, I think you're causing the people down the, the road a little bit of a problem. It's not you, you're not in their face, you're alongside them trying to help them out. So maybe it's something, you know, those of us thinking about it can look out for some of the other folks. Nice, that was very helpful to me. Um, the noise issue is a, is a big issue for me, and I'm at this panel because I really don't know how to deal with a lot of these problems. And this is my third pork fest, and I did have problems with um, noise in the past, and this is the pork fest that I finally got it, that so much of that is from enthusiasm. And, um, and I also really got it how much, um, you know, young people who are just bursting with, um, you know, testosterone and enthusiasm and everything, a lot of them are so polite. I just, like, they're so well-mannered once you get to them. I, I just couldn't believe it. So last night, people were having, um, you know, some kind of festival at our, you know, the next tent site. And um, I just shouted, we're trying to sleep. And they said, sorry. <laughs> and it took them a few minutes to pipe down. Um, and then later, it, they did get loud again. but. I already was eased in my heart because I knew that they weren't just assholes, that they were just enthusiastic and I was able to sleep better. And the other thing I want to say is I did read every page in the booklet and I did not know that there was a quiet and a loud area, so that does need to be made more clear, I think. I think the principle is that the entire campground is quiet and, there, um, and we just kind of let people slide down here on the field, on, on the quiet zone. Well, a couple of years ago, it was explicitly stated that this was the noisy area, and, and this far end, at least, was the quiet area. That was where families should go. I, and I think that 
hasn't been stated as clearly in recent years, but the old timers remember it, and so we think that everybody knows it, and that's just wrong. So, yeah. So I'm glad you guys have been so talky this morning, because I'm certainly not. And uh, are there, are there, we should probably wrap up uh, pretty quick here, so if anyone has any uh, final uh, conclusions or, or thoughts they want to get out. Anybody? Ah. Don't pick your nose on stage, right? right. No, I say it's a, we just say free Bloody Marys in the tent at 10 o'clock and <laughs> the room will be packed. Ask nicely and you'll get your free Bloody Mary. All right, last call. Going once, going twice. Oh, there you go. I, I think one of you mentioned that it, it boils down to when, when you're making registrations. What if you had two or three questions that you ask people as they're registering? What's your primary thing here? Are you coming with a group of people? Are you coming as a family? Are you going to be looking for quiet time? Are you going to be selling something out of the back of your vehicle? Maybe we can help better put you in a more appropriate area and actually have that conversation at the point of registration. Yeah, and thank you for volunteering to work the registration decks next year. We really appreciate that. All right, thank you all for coming. See you around. Thanks, everybody. Wait, one more guy. Just uh, a real quick thought, maybe kind of a last, uh, last ditch effort uh, with the noise issue, with my teenage son, who's at home now, back from college, stays up all night long, every night, doing whatever. And, uh, you know, I got, I got so tired of just trying to talk to him, because I'm not going to force him to do anything. I'm not going to punish him for keeping me up or anything. So, finally I said, look, um, how much money would it take to... Uh, to get you to be quiet at night. And uh, he just said, Dad, you don't have to pay me, you know. I will try to be quieter, you know. And he, he really made an, an effort to be quiet, and actually he's, he's even trying to be quiet. He's still not that quiet, just doors. And I finally got an air conditioner in the room, and I, it's an engineering control, I, tur I call it. Turn on the fan, shut the door, and that's it. But I think, you know, why not offer to pay somebody or to, to barter with them and say, what would it take to get you to cut your party off early tonight, you know? All right, thank you all for coming. Okay.